I don't normally get excited about lorries. I personally find them noisy big boxy things. I do like seeing them charge down the motorway though, and I used to get excited when mum used to pretend to race them to try and stop the child version of Mia from annoying my little brother. By the way, she still does this today, usually to distract me from playing with the radio. Yeah, today we're going to talk about lorries. Not these ones, they're horrid. These ones. Up until the 1960s, horses shunted in the yards, helping support the railways. Before the era of the iron horse, it was them themselves that pulled the trains. But in the 1930s, they were very popular as haulage, taking cargo from the stations and sidings into the towns. The horses were very popular with the locals, but they were animals, and horses in particular can be rather stubborn. And there is truth in the fact that if horses don't want to do something, nothing on earth will make them. Napier and Sons Limited had been around for over a century and was specialised in producing a variety of machines and products. Napier at first wasn't a company, it was a man called David. David was born into engineering and his family became famous not just for engineering but for shipbuilding and metalwork. In 1808 he moved south and founded D. Napier and Sons and invented various machines, including machines for the military and for the Bank of England in its coin making process. His grandson Montague thought he would take the company into a new direction and to appease his own passion for racing, motor vehicles. It wasn't long before Napier was taking both the motor racing scene and the luxury car scene to a whole new level. One of the more famous engines was the 1902 Gordon Bennett Entry. Although it was a free speed shaft drive engine in the new colour British Racing Green, it won the race and was the first ever British victory in international motorsport. It did win by default as the other two engines dropped out, but a win is a win. As horse gave way to motor car, more and more elite wanted this new technology. Napier was forced to move to a larger factory in London. By 1907, over 1,200 people were working at the factory, making about 100 cars a year for the public. And its cars excelled on the tracks. It made runs on the newly opened Brooklyn's track and made a famous 24-hour run with an average 65 mile an hour speed covering 1,581 miles. It was a record that stood for nearly 18 years. After the First World War, work in Napier cars began to wane. Its last car was produced was built in 1919, but its new Lion engine was becoming the company's best seller and was adapted for both land and water. Malcolm Campbell, father of water speed star Donald Campbell, used a Napier Lion engine in his car known as the Napier Campbell Bluebird and reached speeds of a staggering 195 miles an hour at its peak. The London and North Eastern Railway though had a problem. Its primary source of haulage, other than steam, was horsepower. It relied on horses to take freight to and from the towns and villages that didn't have railways. Horses were expensive to look after, needed constant care and were unpredictable. They needed a better and more economical solution and felt that the new and up and coming motor car was it. They approached Napier and asked them to produce a mechanical horse that was able to travel from the railways to local villages. Napier took on the challenge but the idea was sold on to another company to help complete it, Scammel. Scammel had been around not as long as Napier but specialised in coach design and coach building. The company branched out to repairing and providing maintenance to the fod and steam wagons and the investment it brought made the company appear rather comfortable. One of their customers had imported an American automobile tractor and was impressed with its performance and asked Scammel to make a version of their own. Scammel was keen to take up the offer but the First World War halted the plans. But while the war had stopped the project, it had showed the future in haulage travel. The evolution of mechanical transportation in the war had shown just how versatile and important this technology was, and Scammell was keen to develop it. In 1930, Scammell took the initial designs from Napier and refined them. 
It had a single front reel which could be steered 360 degrees and it was simple and sturdy. It was manufactured in two different sizes dependent on the railway's needs. The mechanical horse was found to be extremely nimble but it was prone to stability issues due to the engine being situated on the left hand side of the cab. Despite this, the mechanical horse was popular with both the railway and funnily enough the military. The armed forces loved the new transports in stores and on aircraft carriers. In 1948, a new free-reeled lorry came onto the scene, the Scamel Scarab. Unlike the mechanical horse with its square front, the Scarab had a much more snub-nosed design and a central engine, removing that pesky stability issue with its predecessor. Newly formed British Railways loved the design. The chassis and the design of the trailer was unchanged, but it had a new 2-litre side valve engine made by Scammell themselves. There was also a diesel version, but this carried a third-party Perkins engine. The Scammell Scarabs were a perfect replacement to the horse and car, and they were a regular sight in and around the railways in the 1950s and 60s. They were perfect for short-haul deliveries and parcel runs to and from the stations. Scammell tried to improve on the free-wheeled Scammell by producing a four-wheeled version, but it was not as good as the job as the original, and after less than 100 made, the Scarab 4 was scrapped. The Scarabs lasted until 1967 and was eventually replaced with the Scammell's Townsman, but the Scarabs were documented to be well used well into the 70s. However, developments and time called on the old engines and they were decommissioned one by one and replaced with modern four-wheeled lorries. Nowadays, the days of freight and parcels being delivered to your local station are long gone, so the station lorry is no longer required. Freight is still a part of the railway, but is processed in large depots away from the consumer's eyes. Out of over 30,000 scammels, about only 60 remain. But it's not all doom and gloom. Heritage Lines engine and scammel enthusiasts are keen to recreate that wondrous times by salvaging and restoring the scammels back to working order and the examples are wondrous. There are many trusts and groups that are helping to cement the scammels history. Some choose to recreate the scammels as they were in their blood and custard traditional rivery, while others take a more unique approach and they are very popular at rallies and shows. It's a bit of a shame that these aren't around when I was younger, as they have a certain charm. And although they aren't railway engines, they are a part of railway life, as much as steam itself. <laughs>